All right, John's Gospel, chapter one, if you got it there in front of you, say amen. And uh, let me just get you to stand in honor of God's word this morning. John chapter one, beginning in verse one. We're gonna go through verse five today. The Bible says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, what does your Bible say? God, yeah, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the, what does your Bible say? Darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's bow together. Father, we are grateful that we can sing praises to your name, that you hear us, and Lord, that you inhabit the praises of your people. So I rest completely in your word that you are here this morning, desiring to speak to hearts and transform lives. So God, would you do that, helping individuals know what their next step really needs to be in following you? And would you use your word to shape us into the image of your son so that we live in a manner that brings you absolute glory? We pray for those who have not yet trusted in you, that you'd do a work in their hearts today and just draw them to salvation. And for those who do know you, Lord, would you drive a genuine passion in our souls to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with those who are far from you. And we'll trust you to work this morning. And that's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. So you can be seated this morning. So as mentioned before, today we begin a verse-by-verse -verse study through the New Testament book of John. Just to kind of give you a little background on the book of John, John is one of the four gospels in the New Testament. The word gospel just simply means good news. So you have the book of John, but you also have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all four of them were eyewitnesses to the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you and I are kind of plowing through the book of John, we're not reading about what John kind of heard. Uh, we're not reading about something that had been passed down to John over generations. John was firsthand eyewitness to every single thing that happened in the life and ministry of Jesus. And so he's using this gospel now really to declare who Jesus is so that people might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Gospel of John is quite unique. It's been described before as a pool in which a child can wade or an elephant can swim. So the imagery there is that the Gospel of John is very simple and yet it is extremely profound. Matter of fact, throughout the centuries, the Gospel of John has been described as the holy of holies of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, when you study the temple of God, you have the Holy of Holies. That's the place where the glory of God fell and the children of Israel had the opportunity to see his glory. So when you look at the Gospel of John, it's been described as the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. And the reason is because as we walk through the Gospel of John, you will get an opportunity to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John's Gospel, uh, just again so that we're all on the same page, was written by uh, check this out, I went to seminary to learn this. A guy named, anybody can guess? Yeah, John, John's the one who wrote this particular gospel. He also authored a few other letters, first, second, and third, John, and then he is the one who also wrote the book of Revelation. Interestingly, as you read through the gospel of John, you will discover that he never calls himself by his name. But instead, when he does refer to himself, he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, John was a part of the inner circle of Jesus and his disciples. So you have in the ministry of Jesus, 12 disciples who were following Christ. And then there were three, Peter, James, and John, who were extremely close to Jesus. They were kind of the ones who were the closest of all of the disciples. So Peter, James, and John. Matter of fact, just so you are aware, John and his older brother James on one occasion were called sons of thunder by Jesus. And I love that text of scripture in the New Testament as they're called the sons of thunder because of why Jesus spoke of them in that manner. It's because individuals were mistreating Jesus and so John and James who were brothers, they were like, oh, we got a good idea and they came to Jesus and they said, these people are mistreating you, why don't you allow us to call down fire from heaven to burn them all alive? Well, there's some great guys right there, right? So uh, they were called sons of thunder because they wanted lightning to fall on people making fun of Jesus. Now, I will tell you this, as John was following Jesus, his life was radically transformed. He went from being a son of thunder to becoming what's known as the apostle of love. And as you read through his writings, he gets that name uh, very aptly because he actually uses the word love 80 times in his writings. As a matter of fact, I will tell you, he's not, you know, 
you know, adverse from repeating himself multiple times. As a matter of fact, he mentions the word truth 45 times. And then he mentions the word believe 100 times in his writings. Matter of fact, John's gospel is written with the express purpose to help people believe in Jesus. That's what John himself wrote in John 20 verses 30 and 31. Listen to the Bible. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. These have been written so that you may, check this out, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John was so radically transformed by Jesus that he had this great desire to share the good news of Christ with as many people as possible. And one of the ways that he sought to do that was write this particular gospel, the good news, so that he might influence others as they read through the gospel to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I will tell you as a follower of Jesus, personally, and you as a follower of Jesus, we should also have the same desire as John had. John wanted many people to believe in Jesus. You should want many people to believe in Jesus. I should want many people to believe in Jesus. And here's what I would say to you this morning. If you're here today and you say, well, Levi, I follow Jesus, but I don't really care about helping other people believe in Jesus. So a couple of things. Number one, uh, if you have no genuine concern for souls to be saved, know this, you are not saved yourself. Number two, if you are not burdened for others to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then ask the Lord to give you a burden. Say, God set upon my shoulders a burden to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those where I live, where I work, where I spend my extra time. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Sagemont, we are called to help people take their next step in following Jesus. And one of the primary ways that we can do that as disciples of Christ is to encourage people to take the step of faith and actually trust in the Lord Jesus. Now that is what John is doing with this gospel. That's what he's gonna do this morning as he introduces you and I to Jesus. In fact, in John chapter one, verses one through five, that's what he does. He introduces, he says, listen, I'm writing about Jesus, let me just go ahead and put him out here center stage so you can see who he is in all of his glory. And I would say to you as a follower of Jesus, that should be your heart as well that you would live in such a manner, that I would live in such a manner, that we are putting Jesus out center stage so that others might have the glorious opportunity to be rescued out of their sin and be brought to redemption that is only found in Jesus Christ. Listen, are you living like this? Am I living like this? You and I are gonna learn how to share Jesus through this gospel. As a matter of fact, today, the key question that we could simply ask of the text and then answer it is, how can we encourage people to believe in Jesus? So if you're a note taker, you wanna jot that down at the very top of your page, how can we encourage people to believe in Jesus? If you're not a note taker this morning, pretend that you're a note taker and start writing on your hand. How can we encourage people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? The very first thing that we can do is we can point to Jesus as God the Son. We can point to Jesus as God the Son. Now, before we just dive right into this text and start barreling through it, I kind of have a spoiler alert. You know what a spoiler alert is? That's whenever you're watching, you know, you're about to go watch a movie and maybe somebody else has already seen it, and so they're gonna tell you the end of it, so they're like, spoiler alert, if you don't wanna know the end of the movie, close your ears. Well, spoiler, don't close your ears. Are y'all with me saying yes? But spoiler alert on this particular text of scripture, and that is when John describes the word, in the beginning was the word, the term word actually is a reference to Jesus. Matter of fact, in John chapter one and verse 14, the Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is a reference to Jesus. So quick question for everybody in class this morning. When we mention the word in John's gospel chapter one, who are we talking about? Starts with J, ends with Jesus. Who is it? It's Jesus, right? So the word is, come on somebody, Jesus, right? So John sets the scene for us. Notice what he begins this gospel with. Look at the phrase, John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning. Now, if you grew up in church like I grew up in church, maybe you went to Sunday school class and you were seated in a class, and let's say the teacher says to the class, I got this great kind of test for everybody in class today. 
I'm going to begin reading a little bit of a verse of Scripture. And I want you, class, to guess what book of the Bible that I'm reading. So let's say I'm the Sunday school teacher, you guys are my class, and I begin reading and I say to you, in the beginning, what book would come to mind? Yeah, the book of Genesis, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So here's what's unique about John as he's writing this gospel. He actually grabs that phrase from Genesis chapter one and verse one, and he puts it in John chapter one and verse one because he wants to tie his readers' minds back to Genesis. And what he's doing in this particular mark is he is elevating this message to go first to the Jew, and then we'll see in just a moment, and also to the Gentile. And by the way, just so we're all, again, on the same page, if you're not Jewish, then you is Gentile. Are you all with me? All right. So here he says, in the beginning. And what's unique about this is that John, with that little phrase, is pointing to a time of absolute preexistence before any creation. So let me say it to you like this. Before there was time, before there was matter, before there was any material in the beginning, John is describing what one author says is the dateless past. The dateless past. So what's the big deal, all right? So before time, before matter, before anything was created, what does the Bible say? In the beginning was the word. Now interesting with the word, word, Word up, are y'all with me? All right, that was a lot of words in that sentence. I felt like I was rapping. But anyway, so uh, the term for word uh, is the Greek term logos. In the beginning was the logos. Now, we don't use that particular word very often, the word logos. But again, just to kind of show you how awesome uh, this particular verse is, whenever John says in the beginning was the logos, he's grabbing the minds of the Jewish people, but also the Gentiles. Now, how's he doing that? Well. When the Jewish person hears the word logos, what they are automatically thinking about is God personified. So that's the imagery that they have in mind. So literally the term logos for the Jewish mind was actually a religious term. But to those who were of a Gentile nature, that is all the other ethnic groups who are not Jewish, they didn't grow up with the Old Testament scriptures. So the word logos did not mean deity personified, but it did have a meaning. And the meaning was the ultimate intelligence. It wasn't a religious term to the Gentile mind, it was more of a philosophical term. So whenever John begins this particular letter and he says, in the beginning was the logos, he's grabbed the attention of the Jewish people, he's also grabbed the attention of those who are of a Gentile backroom. And what he said backroom, y'all still with me say yes? That was supposed to be background, somebody. <laughs> Happy anniversary, all right, so. What is John actually saying in this text of scripture? In the beginning was the logos. Here's what he's saying. Before matter, before time, before material, the logos, Jesus existed. So look at the preacher eyeball to eyeball for just a moment. Jesus did not come into existence when he was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. Jesus has always existed. In the beginning was the logos. Now notice the next little phrase. And the word was with God. So John had already pointed to the preexistent nature of the word, that is Jesus. Now John is saying that the word is also coexistent with God. So again, we're dropping the plow just a little bit here this morning so you can grab hold of what's being taught. John is letting his readers know, as well as us, that the word has always been around just like God has always been around. There's no start of God, there's no start of the word. There's no end of God, there is no end of the word. Who is the word? Jesus. So John is saying there's no start for Jesus and there is no end for Jesus. The word Jesus is preexistent and he is also coexistent with God the Father. The Son, like the Father, is uncreated, uncaused, and eternal. Eternal. Which leads me to another phrase. Again, just walking through the text, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, this is pretty interesting, right? He's saying Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. The Lagos, the Word, shares the same character, same quality, and essence as God the Father. John's phrasing preserves the distinction between God the Father and God the Son while emphasizing their unity in all other regards. 
And this is very, very important because what it tells us is that not only is the word the eternal God, but the word is also distinct from the eternal God. This can only be true within a Trinitarian viewpoint. There is one God who exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Even in Genesis chapter one, when the Bible says, let us make man in our own image, the term us is a reference to the Trinity. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in perfect unity, having relationship, choosing to create all of humanity. And what's crazy here is John kind of sits down, right? And he's like, okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they've already written their gospel. They're making me look bad. So I need to write my gospel. I need to write what I saw in Jesus. And I I have this purpose. I'm going to write it in such a way to encourage people to look to who Jesus is and believe in him. And the first thing that he elevates is the deity of Jesus. He wants everybody to know that Jesus was indeed God the Son. Why does he do this? I believe it's because it's a tipping point in his own life. Jesus claiming to be God, John heard that and John was transformed by that. Matter of fact, John writes in John 10 and verse 30 how he heard Jesus say, I and the Father are one. He heard Jesus say in John 14, nine, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And then what's more, Jesus predicts his own death and burial and resurrection, and then he pulls it off. And John hears all of this, and he sees Jesus for who he truly is. He is God the Son. He is God, the one who existed before time, who coexists with God the Father, who is self-existing as God the Son. So this is the thing. In our culture, when you and I, right here in this century, have an opportunity to talk about Jesus to others. Again, we live in such a way that we're putting Jesus on center stage. We wanna speak in such a way that we are pointing people to Jesus. Here's what I know for a fact, you probably know this as well. Whenever you point to Jesus as a great leader, people are like, I can get down with that, that's awesome. Yeah, he's a good leader. Whenever you point to Jesus maybe as a great teacher, others will say, I can get down with that as well. He is a great teacher. But as soon as you point to Jesus as God, people start thinking that's weird. So here's what you're tempted to do, here's what I'm tempted to do when we talk about Jesus. We're tempted to actually demote him and not elevate his deity. That is why I love John's gospel. Because John, right out of the gate, putting Jesus front center stage, first thing he wants you to know about him is that Jesus is God the Son. He pre-existed before time, matter, and space. He coexists with God the Father, and he self-exists as God the Son. He is a member of the triune God, the one of whom in the book of Isaiah, the angels sang, holy, holy, holy is he. And why do they say holy three times? Because holy is the Father, holy is the Son, and holy is the Spirit of God. That's who he is. So when you share Jesus, and I share Jesus, do not be ashamed of his deity. Point to Jesus as God the Son. There's another thing we're encouraged to do as we're sharing Christ. We point to Jesus as the creator. Now this is awesome, look at verse two and three. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So again, John is quick to elevate the work of the word who is Jesus. He doesn't want anybody to see Jesus as a created being, but rather as the one who created all things. So John is pointing his readers to the fact that Jesus was with God from the get-go and played a massively major role in creation. The triune God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, in perfect unity created all that exists. And really what John is doing here is he is revealing to us his worldview. When you think about your worldview, that's the way in which you view all things. And John, how does he view all things? He views Jesus as being the creator of all things. When you think about a worldview, what you're trying to do is you're trying to answer the first and primary question, where did we come from? How was everything created? 
Where did the sun come from, the moon, the stars, the trees, the grass that continues to grow in Texas even though I mow it over and over and over again? Where does all this come from? Where do you come from, right? How are you here? How am I here? Jesus was in the beginning and he is the agent through whom God the Father brought everything into existence. All things were created by Jesus. <laughs> Others reiterate this fact as well in the Bible. Remember as we just walked through the book of Colossians to refresh your mind, Colossians 1 16. For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. The Hebrew author also writes, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. Who's his son? Jesus, whom he appointed heir over all things, through whom also he made the world. And this idea of where you came from, where I came from, is a question of origin, right? Where did it all start? And it's interesting because people have made billions off of this concept of where did it all begin. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but you can actually send your spit into the internet with $100 and they'll tell you where you're from. <laughs> Did you know this? Let's be honest, are y'all down for honesty in church, say yes? How many of you have sent some spit into the internet and found out where you came from? Would you slip it up? Y'all are so self-centered. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> I'm just so awesome. I need to figure out where this comes from. Can I say to you, if you haven't done that, keep your spit, save a hundred bucks. You were created by Jesus and you were created for Jesus. That's where you're from. And this is what the Bible says, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So as followers of Jesus, we're commanded to take the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are far from God. We're called to make disciples of all nations. And as we do that, we point to Jesus as being God the Son, but we can also point to Jesus as being the creator of the very person that we are sharing the message of hope with. So when I share the gospel, oftentimes I will say to individuals, uh, you are not an accident. Matter of fact, some of y'all have been here since I've been here, and you probably heard me say that on a Sunday morning as I've preached. Typically towards the end, I may say, hey, listen, you are not an accident. I don't care what your parents say. Come on, somebody, right? All right, it's Father's Day. Some of you named your middle child Oops. Is that not true? It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Some of y'all are looking at your kid right now. Stop that. That does not help their morale by any stretch of the imagination, right? <laughs> oh. So I was going to share something, but I, I filtered it. Praise the Lord. Somebody say... <laughs> So I say amen, right, amen. I mean, I'm just telling you, because it would have been a good story too, man, but it's 24th anniversary, I don't want to bring it up. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm preaching on anymore. But anyway, so um, what does John do? He says, listen, I'm, again, I'm pulling Jesus center stage. Here he is, let me present him to you. He is God the Son, and he is the creator of all things. When you share with other individuals, you won't enter the individuals because they, they want to know where they're from. Why am I here? It's a question of origin, question of worldview. You were created by Jesus. You were created for Jesus. And then you point to, and this is what John does, you point to Jesus as the source of true life. Look again in your Bibles, verse 4 and 5. In whom, that is Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So notice what John is saying. He's saying, in Jesus is life. Jesus did not get this life from someone else. He is the uncreated son of God who has always existed and will always exist. In Jesus is biological life and spiritual life by which he can create the physical world and by which he creates eternal souls. In Jesus is life. And John also goes on to say, in the life was the light of men. Life and light in this text are joined together by John. John is simply saying Jesus, the life, was shining a light to all men. Look, look at the preacher for just a moment. Jesus came into the world to shine the light 
to everybody. Who did he come to shine the light to? Everybody. This is, this is why I love that verse. The light of men. Here John begins to clue us in to why Jesus came to the earth. He came to shine the light, which literally is the imagery of turning the light on so that we might be able to see who God truly is. So I bought, I bought for just a moment. If you're here this morning, you're like, I came to church today, but I don't really know who God is. Can I say to you, that's why Jesus came. He came to reveal to you who God truly is. Uh, Jesus is the visible presence of the invisible God. Jesus is God spelling himself out to the entire world. Jesus turns the lights on so that you can finally see who God truly is. That's why Jesus says in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. And then in verse five in our text today, he says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now the word here for darkness refers to the domain of Satan. Satan is a little G God, little G God of this world system. And the world system is absolutely dark in the sense that the light is cut off as it pertains to who Jesus is, who the Lord truly is. The lights are dim, it is completely dark. Satan loves that world system and he wants to keep the lights out because every single person who is born onto this planet is born in sin, in the darkness, the lights are out as it pertains to who Christ really is. So Satan wants to use the world system to keep the lights out. So I would just say to you this morning, if you don't know Jesus, then guess what? You're in the dark. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you are in the dark and you are, whether you realize it or not, serving the little G God of this world, Satan. And Satan and his demons use the world system to continue to attract your lust and your desires to keep your eyes covered up so that you will not look to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about it, the whole world is dark, the world system, and then all of a sudden, Jesus, are y'all listening, Sam, I'm listening? Jesus invades the very world that he created to do what? overwhelmed the darkness with his light. He came to shine the light of life upon all men so that we might come to know the one true and living God. And then John even says here, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now notice this, and kind of underline this for you on the screen here, the word comprehend is used completely different than the way you and I use it. So typically when we use the word comprehend, what we're saying is, do you understand what I'm saying? Right, so if I share something, it's like, do you comprehend? Are you, are you picking up what I'm putting down? Come on, somebody. That's comprehend, that's the way we use that word. That is not how the word is used in John's Gospel chapter one and verse five. The word for comprehend is another way of saying to overcome or overpower. So think about what's happening here. Again, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome or overpower the light. It's a tremendous truth. But it doesn't mean Satan didn't try. I mean, Satan tried to have Jesus put to death when he was a baby. Satan and demons commonly attacked the ministry of Jesus. Satan used religious people to try to cut the lights out so that others would not see Jesus. Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness three times trying to get him to bow down to him. What was he trying to do? Turn the lights out. And Satan tried to get Jesus to turn away from the ultimate reason that he came, which was to rescue us from the darkness, to go to the cross and die the death that we deserve. And Satan tried to can, you know, keep him from, don't do this, don't do that, Look, come in this direction, follow me. And tried to turn the lights out. Now how many of you know Jesus came to overcome and overpower the darkness with his life. He paid the penalty of our sins by dying in our place, but then he was gloriously resurrected. What happened in that moment? He overcame the darkness. Paul tells us in Colossians 1, again, just kind of tying all this together, he rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So check this out. 
You're born in darkness, I'm born in darkness. Jesus came to turn the lights on. As the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus, as it is shared with other individuals, the Spirit of God illuminates the eyes and the ears of those who are listening and seeing the message so that they might see the light who is Jesus. And then when they trust in Jesus, they are taken out of darkness and placed into the marvelous light of the Lord. I don't know if I've mentioned this before. Have y'all been to Chuck E. Cheese before? (laughs) So, at Chuck E. Cheese, I haven't been lately by the way, just in case you're curious, It's, it's been a while. But at Chuck E. Cheese, there's one of those games that you, you know, you put a dollar in or whatever it is, and uh, you can control this claw that goes into this little box and reaches down to grab stuff and pull out and drop. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Anybody played this game before? That's right, it's legit. So uh, my son won some Beats uh, audio system one time playing this game. Uh, he spent $1,000, but he still won those Beats, baby. <laughs> yeah. If you can imagine that box is the darkness, and what did Jesus do through his death, burial, and resurrection? He came out, he reached around, and one day I was in that box, and he reached down and touched my heart and picked me up and pulled me out of the darkness into his marvelous light. That's what he does, he rescues us. So imagine it this morning, right? We're in church, we're in Sage Mart, right? This is the big box. And perhaps the Lord, through the message this morning, revealing Jesus to you, you have seen him now as God the Son. You have seen him now as the source of life, the creator of all things, and you're you're seeing the light. If you'll trust in Jesus, he will reach down and pick you up and pull you to himself. That's what he does. That's why, that's why the Bible, that's why, this is why I love what Paul says in the book of Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every single person who would believe. Not ashamed of the power of the, oh, I love this. Not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God. It's, it's literally, and that, I'm not preaching on Romans, but I do want you to hear this. Y'all with me say yes? When he says it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe, the word for power there is a word dunamis, which, which literally means power. Are y'all listening? Say I'm listening. It means power on reserve. <laughs> y'all ain't listening. <laughs> what does that mean? That means, check this out. The Lord has so much power, he's got some on reserve. And when it, listen, when I share the gospel, When you share the gospel, you know what we're doing? We are tapping into a reservoir of power that can rescue people out of darkness and bring them into marvelous light. Why would the church do anything other than lift up the Lord Jesus and share his gospel to the nations? That's our calling. I always forget what time this is supposed to be over. <laughs> what time is this supposed to be over? What'd you say? 12.30, good, I still got, let me back that watch up a minute. I got some, I got some, what is that, 30 minutes? <laughs> I literally just spit water on the stage, that was good. <laughs> if you was under it, we'd have counted you for baptism. Come on, somebody. <laughs> So I, I do, I, when I share Jesus, I like to have three objects in front of me when I'm talking with somebody one-on-one. And I, I've kind of introduced, I'm sure, this to you as well already. I've done this at Waffle House, done it at home, so I just get three objects. And so, I, so I got these two speakers up here. These are two objects. Uh, pretend this represents God, this represents you. And listen closely. Uh, you are not an accident. You were created by God and for God. But see the space between you and God? Somebody say yes. That space is there because of sin. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. The payment of our sin is death. So if you die with this huge space between you and God, the Bible says you'll go to hell for all of eternity. But God so loved the world, this is the third object, y'all with me? That he sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And what did Jesus do? 
Jesus came to live a sinless life on your behalf because you couldn't do it, I couldn't do it, so he did it for us. But then he went to the cross at Calvary and he paid the sin debt that we owed to God. We ought to die for our sin, but Jesus died in our place. God the Father treated Jesus Christ the Son as if he committed all of your sin and mine. On the cross at Calvary, Jesus is dying. He's paying for the sins that you committed that I've committed. Then he was buried, which usually I would take the object and lay it down. I'm not going to do that this morning. Y'all with me say yes? But then I would hold it back up again, and I would say, but he was raised again to life. Jesus now becomes a bridge that connects us to God. So if this is you, and this is the little diagram, where would you put yourself? Would you pick the speaker up and set it right on top of this and say, oh, I have already trusted in Jesus? If so, praise the Lord. Or if you're here this morning, would you take the speaker and maybe put it real close? but not on? Would you take the speaker and chunk it way over there? Whether you die over there or you die real close, you go to the same hell. (laughs) Y'all still my buddies out there? (laughs) Why do you say that so blunt? Well, because it helps people. I just like to turn the lights on. Come on, somebody, right? So what do you need to do if you're here this morning and you're here and you've not trusted in Jesus? Do you need to admit that you're a sinner? You need to believe that Jesus died for you and got it from the grave? You need to confess him as Lord. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who would believe. If you've not made that decision, can I look at the preacher? If you've not made that decision, that's why you are in church today. Not just because a buddy invited you, not because you saw the cross outside and you're like, well, let me go inside and see what's going on there. The reason you're here is because God wants you to trust in his son, the Lord Jesus. So check this out. If you, he is a perfect gentleman. If you hear the message, the lights come on for you, but you're like, no, I don't think so. I'm going to continue to go my own way. He will let you. The proverb writer says it this way, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. But if you're here today and you're like, I don't know why I'm here, this is why you're here, because the Lord wanted you to be saved this morning, rescued, trusting in Jesus. Don't miss that. Amen? Let's have our heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking this morning. If you're here today and you say, Levi, man, I would love to uh, trust in Jesus today, then let me encourage you to do so. We had several do it in our first service, and I'd love for you to do that this morning as well. You can walk out of here knowing for certain that you have a relationship with the Lord who created you. So right where you are, if you want to give your life to Christ, let me just encourage you to pray something like this in your heart as I pray out loud. Not a magical prayer, but it is one, I promise you, that will guide you and help you. So, so pray something like this, all right? If you want to know the Lord, you want to put your trust in Him, pray something like this. Just say, Lord... I admit to you that I'm a sinner. Just tell him, right? It's not like you're shocking him. He knows. So just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do to save myself. But I believe Jesus died for me. That he got up from the grave. The best way I know how this morning, I'm turning from my sin and putting my trust in Jesus. Now help me to be unashamed of who Jesus is today. 